Welcome to the Selling in the Motor Trade podcast in association with Simcoe Training. This is the weekly podcast where we share best practice tips and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve your service department, and generally put more profit into your dealership or dealer group. I'm your host, Simon Bogert. Now, some of you probably already know me as Skippy. I want to start by saying thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. Hi, welcome to another episode of Selling in the Motor Trade. And listen, first, I'm going to say thank you so much to all the listeners. Uh, so many of you are actually subscribing to this at the moment, and it's getting shared around with lots of other people in the motor trade. This podcast is all about sharing best practice tips and ideas on how to sell more cars, uh, improve the after sales or the service and parts department. So I just want to say thank you so much. Now, today, it is my pleasure to have Dale Wyatt on. Now, Dale Wyatt is the Director of Automobiles for Suzuki Cars in the UK. Now, for anyone who's been living under a rock and doesn't know Dale, um, Dale is all over LinkedIn. And Dale and I have been communicating through LinkedIn for, goodness me, it's got to be since LinkedIn started, Dale. Uh, I've bumped into Dale at the NADA conference, and I've been trying to get Dale on this podcast now for two years and i'm so excited to get here and uh get dale on the podcast so dale i want to say thank you for your time i really appreciate it it's a pleasure to be here simon you pinned me down at last <laughs> yes I'm yes uh, well, well listen is, uh, is that that point there well so hold on is this good follow-up now or am i actually pushing it too far now but good sales people we follow up right well, I mean, uh, you demonstrated a good process you kept following up until i said yes well done <laughs> that's good that's good thank you for that um, so listen, can you tell us a little bit about the young Dale? Uh, growing up in school, uh, what did you want to do with your life? Was it always motor trade? No, no, quite the contrary. My father was a builder. Mm -hmm. and I thought that I would leave school and did. and work for my father and be a builder and take over his business. Unfortunately, I was a rubbish builder. <laughs> and my okay. father had to fire me uh, for my own good. So, um, so, so yeah, I thought I was going to be a builder. Realised that I wasn't good with my hands. And I embarrassed my father and I had to go and find my own way. And thankfully, I found that I was quite good at speaking. Ah, and, okay. um, and I worked for a company called Abbey Life, selling wow. insurance and double glazing. And it changed my life something. Wow, that's proper selling. Now, double glazing insurance. Are, are we talking door to door, appointments made? Are you Talk to us about that part of your life. Yeah, I was, doing, oh, selling. I was, yeah, I was selling insurance and pensions mm -hmm. where you're selling a story. You're getting somebody to think about an event in their life rather than a product. Mm. And um, it was a really good experience. I had a guy called Dave Ludlam who took me under his wing. Mm. And I, was a, I was a bright, enthusiastic, brash, overconfident lad. And he straightened me out a little bit and got me on straight and narrow. I remember he took me to a, a very rich street in Bournemouth called Holdenhurst Road, mm. which is full of mansions. We started at one and started cold calling. But this is we knocking on the door, getting doors slammed in your face. Exactly. When you knock on a door and a butler answers, wow, that's a, that's a that's a lesson in sales. I can tell you. Yeah. Wow, that is really so. Um, th this is a shameless plug for our first ninety day sales training program. Uh, we often say that the skills we learn in our first three months or first ninety days, good and bad, lasts for the rest of our life. Can I ask you back with Dave? Okay, as your mentor. Back when you were selling life insurance, double glazing, is there any lessons you learned in your first three months that is as relevant today for someone else starting in the motor trade in their first three months? I think so. I think so. I think um, respect the process hmm. would, be, would be the bit. I think um, there is a process and there's a process for a reason. And um, you can shortcut it and get away with it sometimes, but eventually it will catch you out. So I would say respect the process. The best salespeople realize there's a process you need to go through mm. and um, respect it. It doesn't mean you can't express yourself. It doesn't mean you can't have a personality, but there's some non-negotiable things you're going to have to do. If you want to sell a car, sell, sell a pension, sell insurance or sell anything. And respecting that process is important. You're never, you're never too skilled mm. to forget the skill of the process is what I would say. Yeah, okay. So can you, what does the journey look like going from selling insurance, double glazing, you've learned lots of lessons there, to how do you join the motor trade then? I worked for a company called Parkco, and I was a sales rep selling um, garage equipment and parts. Okay. To get a motor trade. 
And that was my first introduction to to the motor trade and to management, which was really, really a good experience. I ran a number of parts distribution branches. Mm-hmm. And when you're running it, when you're in your early 20s, running a team of 20 van delivery girls in the 80s and 90s, I can, I can rest assure you it's a, it's a good positive learning experience, Simon. You'd learn a lot quick. <laughs> really quick. So start the motor trade through parts, but dealing with dealers day in, day out, trying to sell exactly. them equipment um, and all that stuff. Uh, I understand now, a friend of the show, John O'Hanlon, says to say hello. And I understand you two go way back. Um, you move from there. Is that when you went into Volkswagen? Because I know from John, you're working on the sponsored dealers program with Volkswagen. That's... Um, that's going back a while now, John tells me. Is that yeah, where you went yeah. straight into Volkswagen from there? Yeah, I joined Volkswagen as an area manager mm-hmm. and then became a regional manager and then took over the sponsor dinner program. Mm-hmm. Job title was Development Ventures Manager, which is a wonderful program. We we would find really talented individuals who had all the skills to run their business mm-hmm. and loan them a big interest for free loan, a million pounds typically. Mm-hmm. A number of, number of great businesses were born as a result. There were so many. And this yeah. is sort of in the 90s, early 90s, is it? Yeah, now? exactly. Kind of the early 90s. Yeah, late 90s, 94. Okay. 2004, that sort of period. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was a really good experience because it it taught me about business. I was a non exec director on a number of businesses. Mm-hmm. I was working with startup, startup businesses and all the enthusiasm and excitement that goes with that. Yeah. And I, understood, I understood how the legal profession worked, I understand insurance and banking and finance. And director's duties and all of those boring things that keep you out of jail. Mm-hmm. Your business, how important they are. So it was a really good experience. And I learned about entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a certain breed to be an entrepreneur. And I think you need to manage and work with an entrepreneur in a certain way to get the best out of them. And I think those skills have kind of helped me do my job really well from then. Can I ask you, how did you identify uh, someone to go into one of these sponsored dealers? Were were they coming to you in, in plagues or did you go out and try and find them? And that leads me on to what were some of the key ingredients that you were looking for to make the decision to, you know, give them a loan of a million upwards? Um, yeah, we worked with Gallup to create a structured interview. Mm-hmm. And we developed an assessment to understand the profile of somebody. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we and we use a strategy where we interviewed for somebody's weaknesses because we found that we know that for every strength there's an opposite side there's a delta there's a weakness and skilled salespeople are really good at selling their strengths right we asked for them to give us evidence of examples of their weaknesses because that would prove their strength existed so an example is most entrepreneurs have a high ego mm-hmm. most entrepreneurs are very driven yep most entrepreneurs don't take no for an answer. So one of the questions we'd ask for is, can, can you give me an example where when you got into trouble by going ahead, going above the head of somebody and talking to their boss because ah, they said no? I get it now. I get it. I was trying to get my head around that one. So when they turn around and say, ah, my boss said no, but I've gone and put this program in and that program in. and um... or, or the area manager said no, so I rang the brand manager. Or the brand manager said no, so I rang the MD. An entrepreneur will not take no for an answer. They'll keep pushing. And um, that's a negative trait, some would say, or a positive trait. Mm-hmm. But it's a reflection of somebody who's really driven. It doesn't take no, f- no for an answer. So we look for ex- examples of them displaying negative traits. Yeah. Okay. I love that. I love that whole idea there. And it's something else you mentioned to me in the past. Um, you said you can't put in what God left out. They have to have those raw ingredients to start with. Um, I, I suppose that's very, very important as well. And that's one of the raw ingredients, isn't it? Not accepting exactly. no. Um, well, you want somebody with high ego, high drive, somebody who's willing to take a risk. Yeah. Somebody who's, who's willing to, to defend their own opinion. Um, so, 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 yeah, we we often use the phrase, you can't put in what God left out. Hmm. And um, I've got a view that says you can take somebody who's a 7 or 8 out of 10 to a 10. You won't yeah. take somebody who's three out of ten to a ten. You might, might take them to a five mm. or a six, but you're not going to take them to a ten. Yeah. So um, be careful with the threes and fours because you can't put in what God left out. I love that. I love that. Uh, this is going is coming straight from John at uh, Ridgeways. 
Okay. And he said that, um, you know, they had two dealerships to start with, went through a lot of growth, obviously. And he said some of the teething problems we had there were organization and planning. And Dal come in and just bash their heads together and said, you've got to get the start of the process right. And he said, you've got to ask Dale about the apricot. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you explain the apricot for us? It was a peach, yeah. Well, peach. peach. Oh, the peach, sorry. Peach. Yeah, and I think I think um, um, John Hannon and David Newman, who were, who, were the, who were the guys from Ridgeway, wanted to run a business with a with a real customer centric, mm. employee centric nature, a real soft, gentle, easy to do business business. But it had to have a hard stone like a peach. Had to have some proper processes, and had to have some non negotiable activities. And you had to be competent and follow the process as well as being soft and gentle on the outside. So there were there was a stone, there was a hard center mm. of the business. So it felt soft and fluffy, but it was well run and hard and, and properly managed on the inside. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. It does all of that. So uh, the sponsored dealers, um, you must look back with a great lot of pride that um, somewhere that I suppose you started um, with that business there and then sold off to Marshalls and many, many others there. Um, did you ever decide at some point, hey, I want to do this for myself? Or did you always like working from the OEM side of it? Yeah, I thought about it and, um, and I, I was excited by it. But I never found the right opportunity. Yeah, mm. I've always loved dealers and always thought that um, that I might make a good sponsored dealer. But um, one of the things I have learned is it's, it's very easy to commentate on running a dealership. It's very different to actually run one. Mm. So um, I'm not sure whether or not I would have been elite in that area. Well, you, you've definitely run a very good business anyway, where you are at the moment. I understand you voted uh, number one most trusted brand, and this is Suzuki. Was it seven out of the last nine years? Uh, yes. I think if that if I got the numbers right there. Yes, yeah, seven out of the last nine surveys. So they surveyed twice a year. And um, yeah, um, I guess as you get as ever as I have, you pick up a few awards and I've won a number of awards. But the thing that I'm most proud of is our customer satisfaction award. That's that's so, just not picking up though. Seven out of the last nine surveys. Um, there's got to be a secret to that success there. Now we know a Suzuki is built well. They're relying. They're built about reliability, but so are lots of other Japanese brands. There's got to be something more than just that. What's the secret of Suzuki's success there? Well, I think it's a combination of things. I always talk about having oodles of personality underpinned by process. So that combination of people skills and process skills work. And I also talk about focusing on the things that make a difference. And um, I've got five tips for you, if you want, Simon. To, yes. To help you. Yes, please. Yeah. And these are and these are things that maybe might, some people might want to think about. The number one thing is don't bonus the score. A lot of Sorry. manufacturers don't bonus score. I know many dealers will bonus the score. Don't yeah. bonus score from an OEM or a dealer's point of view or both. From an OEM perspective, a lot of a lot of OEMs bonus the score. And that forces dealers to gain the system rather than to focus on the actual customer. Mm. So you can imagine as, as a, how it must feel as a customer when the dealer says, it's really important to me that you give me a, a 10. You're going to get a survey. Please tick the 10 survey. Mm -hmm. Can I remind you to tick the 10 survey? That's gaming, gaming the score. We want, to, we want to get proper feedback so that we can yeah. improve the business. Yeah. So we encourage dealers to have an action plan. And we might bonus an action plan, but never bonus the score because you end up, you end up gaming the system. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. Second yep. one is establish your core non-negotiables. So focus on core process. And I'll give you an example. We have five non-negotiables in the Suzuki sales process. And they're warm welcome to the customer. Mm -hmm. Take the customer's details. Mm -hmm. Present the product. Present the product. Follow them up. And tell them, they, tell them the, your why buy from me story. Mm -hmm. The other five things, and um, there are there are many other things you could measure, but those five things are pretty core. Yeah, through our mystery shop program, we've got ninety four percent of our dealers doing all of those things every time with every customer. I think it makes a difference. And my yeah. um, and my um, third thing, is focus on the dissatisfiers. What are the things that are going to really irritate customers? Mm. And try to remove those. Okay. What are some of the dissatisfiers you found in Suzuki? Um, I'll give you an example. One of the dissatisfiers was um, courtesy cars. 
Yeah. I think most dealers have got more jobs than they've got cars. We we can't register courtesy cars left, right and centre. Unfortunately, we just, budget doesn't allow. Always okay. a problem. So, yeah, so what we did at Suzuki was we reframed the customer proposition. And we said that we would provide alternative transport to every customer. And alternative transport could be a taxi, a collection and delivery, or a courtesy car. What that did was reframe the customer's expectation without without reducing these level of customer satisfaction. Okay. Another yeah. example is um, um, car valets, car valets. Mm-hmm. Some cars arrive and need a wash and vac. Some cars arrive and we need a full valet. Yeah. What we did was um, make our promise that we would do a wash and vac, not a valet. And a valet was another service. So reframing the proposition and actually reducing the customer's expectation of what good looks like and delivering it every time was a good strategy for us. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Because you were washing back the car and it's still not polished to an inch of its life when they bought it. The expectations might be different to what we were going to do. So change the wording. Love it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so kind of, yeah, kind of reframing the experience, getting the non-negotiables, removing those dissatisfiers, and getting people to focus on the customer rather than the score. Mm. The score follows. The score is a lag measure. The, the customer interaction is the thing that's going to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay, love that. I'm counting away. Is that number four or is that number five? Uh, whatever it is, you've got them all. Yeah, I've got them all. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was very fortunate to go on some training through Ritz Carlton Hotels. And uh, as a hotel, the, the guy there said, who took the training, brilliant. He said, There's seven hotels at our level in Manhattan. And he said, Never forget, Simon, you can't buy customer satisfaction, you have to earn it. He said, These seven hotels, we've all got the best beds money can buy. They've all got views over Central Park or Manhattan skyline. They've all got the best Michelin star chefs we can buy. And there's only so much you can do with a lump of cow to make a difference. He said it's the unexpected Wales people. And and Dal, he talked about three simple stories. One, and I'll only give you one, that a man was staying outside. uh, Well, of course, he's staying at the hotel from out uh, out of town for three nights. His toothpaste ran out. Now, normally the the premier ends I'm staying in, the the people clean the room would just say, oh, it's run out, leave it in the bin or do nothing. But of course, the maid there didn't. She took ownership in it and was unexpected. She went to the gift shop, got a tube of toothpaste and wrote a simple little note down there. I couldn't help but notice your toothpaste had run out. I took the liberty of getting this for you. Sorry, it's not the same brand that you're using. Thanks, Betty. And of course, Dale, this man is raving about this hotel but he said you've got to analyze it he's not way raving about the atminster carpet the the latest plasma screen tv in the room it's a dollar 20 toothpaste but someone that cared about it and took ownership there Uh, and i always remember that story it's the little things that wows customers exactly so it's about about meeting the customer's needs rather than processing the customer yeah and it's about anticipating and being empowered to just do the right thing. Yes. Empowered. Bruce Carlton, yeah, Bruce Carlton talked about giving their customers a warm welcome and a fond farewell. They do. I like they, that language. And I think that's kind of the tone we're looking for within Suzuki. I, I, I absolutely love it. That that brings me on to the trusted car brand for those who are proud to be different. Um, this is uh, Suzuki's, um, do I want to use the word vision do i use the word mission statement and um, can, can you just explain your thinking behind that vision yeah we um we, we we knew that we wanted to make a step change in the way that our dealers were looking after our customers and the best way to do that was to create a new vision so we created a vision that we called the trusted car brand for those who are proud to be different which was 12 words and four themes and the four themes were trust mm-hmm. it was about something bigger than trust between dealer and customer. It's also trust between manufacturer and dealer and manufacturer and supplier. So we wanted to build a really trusted, close relationship. We want to be every dealer's favorite franchise and every supplier's favorite customer. Mm-hmm. That makes sense? Yep. Um, so that was the trusted. For those, was about realizing that we didn't want to win everybody's business. We're a 2% share brand. So we can afford to be not for 98% of the population 
Providing we've got two percent of a raving fan, Simon. I, I, I mean, what you are rather than what you're not was an interesting piece for us. That's that's brave. You're gonna get this right again. Two percent market share. So actually, if we don't, if we're not the right people for ninety percent of the people, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Uh, that's brave, isn't it? Thinking it that way. Uh, I think I so. love I it. Think... I think you're right, but it's it's brave, isn't it, Dale? Yeah, I think so. I think what it does is enable you to think in a really focused way, mm. and, yeah, and it gives you confidence to not follow the crowd. Interesting. So Interesting. I think um, so that was the for those beats bit. And pride, or pride was the connection we wanted to feel, feel between each other. And different was the fact that um, we we could be different. We didn't have to be constrained by the rules of business. We didn't have to be constrained by what the competition we're doing. We could express ourselves. And we have an entrepreneurial network of owner drivers who all want to express themselves. We want to encourage that. Somebody who was a, a a personality in their community, mm. and we wanted to give them give them, our dealers license to be them at their best, not for them to have to follow a formula. And that that was where the different piece came in. So we want dealers to achieve their charity potential, look after their customers and make money. They can do that. Why am I going to micromanage them? That's that's the experience I want to, I want them to deliver. I, I'm just thinking of people like um, uh, Robin Luscombe, um, uh, one of our clients, and uh, of course, when you're a great deal, has been on the podcast as well, um, and he really is proud to be different. Uh, we won't sell your car, we'll help you buy one, is his slogan all the time there. Um, and he definitely does. It, it is not part of the, uh, how do I say, the mould. He is definitely different. And I imagine he's just one of, uh, what, 120 Suzuki businesses that you have, or hundred? How many dealers are there now? Yeah, 150, 150. 150 Suzuki dealers who are all Robin Luscombe's different. This is our business. Um, yeah, exactly. I think I think they feel that um, we're partners, mm. and there's an interdependency between us, and we try and focus on our own job. Mm. So a lot of time talking about roles and responsibilities and making sure that we don't duplicate, don't overlap, and we allow the dealers to create their own brand in their own territory. That amplifies ours. I think a lot of other manufacturers look to suppress the dealer brand. Yeah. And often in rural communities, the dealer brand is as big or not bigger than our brand. It is. Yeah. You're right sometimes. Absolutely. In rural communities. I was at one meeting, and I, I won't mention the uh the OEM, it wouldn't be fair to say, but he started off with a conversation saying, um, you'll uh, to dealers, you'll understand I'm not talking about a partnership. Most OEMs talk about partnership. Uh, we don't believe in a partnership because we're, we're more powerful than you. We don't believe that we could actually have a partnership with one party's more powerful than the other. And I just, I heard this. And I thought, oh, that leaves a bad taste in mouth being one of the dealers there. Uh, and that's completely opposite to your thinking. You are definitely a partnership uh, with the guys. Yeah, I mean, um, we talk about an interdependency. Hmm. We talk about... Uh a proper partnership based on but, but, but based on just getting along. I think it was Bill Parfit who said, he once famously said, and Bill Parfit was um, MD of Volkswagen, Vauxhall for years. He said, it's all about trust and understanding. And the problem is that they don't trust us and we don't understand them. And mm -hmm. I've always tried to kind of reverse those two things around if I can, you know? Yeah, yeah, cool. And um, make it easy for people to buy it. Listen, you told me a story about a pen that you bought, the Mont Blanc pen. And yeah. can you relay that story to our listeners? I, I It just um, it, it yeah, resonated I, I with always, me. I always think about it when I think about giving customers experiences. And that um, when I was working for Parco, selling parts, I earned a bonus, which was a big bonus to me. It was enough for me to, be able to treat myself to a Mont Blanc pen and a leather case. Mm -hmm. And I could buy a pen for a couple of pounds. And this was 200 pounds or more in the 80s or 90s, whatever it was. So it was a big, big purchase for me. And it took me three goes to buy it. But I couldn't find a salesman who deserved the sale. Wow. Three times you went in there knowing what you wanted. And three times. Yeah. Wow. I went to three stores to buy it and just couldn't part with the money because the, the experience wasn't right. The salesman didn't deserve the sale. And I remember going to a, a tobacconist in Bristol that actually sold pens as well. And went and asked about the Mont Blanc pen. And the salesman talked to me about the heritage, told me the story, made me feel really good as a customer. And made me feel good about the purchase. And um, that, and I always always remember that story. Mm. And I think um, we need to earn the right to, 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 to actually get the customer's money. 
Yeah, and man. What's, I love that story, Simon. I, I love it because for that story for me, so many salespeople forget you weren't buying a pen there. You didn't want to write something down. You were buying the reward for what you've worked so hard to get. That was always going to symbolize that bonus that you achieved. Uh, and that's why you want to hear about the heritage of it and why you're expending that and how you felt when you wrote with that pen. Do you still have that pen? I don't. Unfortunately, my car got broken into and it was oh. one of the things that got stolen. I'd love to still have that. It doesn't that break your heart when it's something there. Simon, whenever I talk to a salesman, I want the salesman to imagine there's a room full of people looking down on him. Mm. It all played a part in getting the customer there. That could be an engineer, a designer, mm. a service receptionist, a finance guy, somebody who made the car. And every one of those people passed the baton on to each other. And the salesman is the last receiver of the baton in the relay race. They're not a hero. They've just got to finish the job, not let people down. One salesman to feel the weight of the responsibility of that button. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Love that. Love that. Uh, now, listen, here's the other thing you said there as well. When we were talking about um, the number one um, most trusted brand, you said measure the lead, not the lag. Uh, can you explain your thinking behind that? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think we spend our business too much of our time measuring data. It's already happened. So management accounts or customer satisfaction results or or sales, what we need to do in our business is focus on the activities that will deliver results. Uh -huh. And if you get the activities right, the results will come. And that goes back to my early days. I talked about working for Abbey Life and following the process. If you do the right things, you will get the right results. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily when you deserve them, but they will come. So for me, it's about remembering to do the things that make a difference and do the things that matter. Yeah. So focusing on the lead activities, the lead things, the key things in the driver a result rather than celebrating the lag measures. Mm. So um, I would much rather celebrate order take than registrations, for example. Mm. I'd much but, rather celebrate the number of appointments in the diary. Yes. The number of sales. Yeah, yeah. We, we've got a, a, a great friend and uh, we interviewed him for this, Gavin Hydes. Gavin Hydes runs the Joe Duffy Group in Ireland. And he is one of the few people I know that he does not target he sells people at all on results and when i say that to other leaders i said really no he doesn't what he targets is activity and he, he tells a lovely story that when he was selling cars he'd go home and his daughter would say dad did you sell any cars today he said not today he felt like a loser but then he really he said he doesn't want his sales people feel like losers but what he hadn't told his daughter is, I've actually done three demonstration drives. I made these prospecting appointments and made five appointments for the weekend. And that demonstration drives, the appointments, will give me the result at the end of the month. So he said, in my business, Joe Duffy Group, we're not targeting salespeople on results at all. It's activity, activity, activity. Get the activity right, and the results will look at itself. And that, that's exactly measure the, the, the lead, not the lag. Not the results there. I admire his um uh, his ability to just go and do that throughout the whole group, and um, I, I think it gives him great results. On that, so I remember years ago, I used to work with um, Good Manners. Yes, Good Will Holden. Had... Oh no, sorry, uh, Michael Jackson. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Before we had e Good Manners, we had Good Manners Diaries. Yes, and I remember we used to have a program called Twenty One Points that said every salesman had to achieve twenty one points before they went home. Yeah, and of every course. activity had a points value. So a hand up might, might have a points value. An appointment would have a points value. A follow-up would have a points value. A cold call would have a points value. But you didn't go home until you registered 21 points. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that thinking still lives with me when I think about leading indicators and lag measures. Uh, it's it's true. It's still true. It's um uh, get the activity roll. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is definitely the way that we need to do that. New managers listen to this. Uh, go back and listen to Gavin Hyde's uh, podcast on this and some of the, the e good manner stuff, the diary. Remember the old double page diary? And do, it's yeah. always and backwards. I, I love Michael Jackson's story about um, bought ledgers and how he came up with the idea of it there. Um, and, and it was right. It's the basics, get the basics right, isn't it? So it was. And e good manners, well, the good manner system showed that. Um... The, the, there were sales to happen after the fifth follow-up, if I remember. We used to recall the number of sales happened at follow-up five, six, seven, and eight. Incrementality and persistence, I think, was the report uh, from memory. Uh, you went on the training course, Simon, you remember. That was the one, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and I suppose incrementality and persistence is why we're sitting there and talking today. Uh, exactly. I mean, 
Um, just, my, my boss had a different way of saying it. He said, stay in touch with people till they buy or die. Now, that might be a bit harsh, but you remember these little things. Um, but as long as you're not pushing customers, because it's almost give people information all the time. If you'll give, if you're saying, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Uh, you've crossed the line for me and you're you're pushing. But if you're giving people information all the time, actually, there's never an issue giving people information, uh, but you're staying in touch with them. I agree. You're the expert, Simon. I agree. Uh, I, I don't know about that, but um, uh, we'll take that. We're definitely sitting here because of that never give up uh, approach then. And now talk about management styles then um, and the successes and maybe weaknesses that you may have had um, again, a lovely story you told me when you invited me to Suzuki head office, you said there was a um, a, a group of your managers that uh, had a conversation without you. Someone, some brave person was asked to have a conversation with you, said, uh, Dale, back off your micromanagers. Can you share us that story with us? Yeah, I can. I have one of my guys come to see me and say, Dale, the team have asked me to talk to you. Uh-oh. And I, I said, um you're micromanaging us, you're all over us, you're getting in the way, making us do things twice, you're overchecking us, makes us feel like you don't trust us. Can you do your job and then let us do ours? Your job is to create a vision, march forward, waving the flag, give us the and support us. And we need you leading the business rather than micromanaging us. Mm. Can you do your job, please? Which was a a brave guy. Oh, but, yes. Um, I was pleased that he had the confidence and the courage to talk to me. And it taught me a lesson about doing my job. My job is to lead the business. My job is to create an environment to enable the team to perform and to and to be informed and content. And um, and I slipped into the micromanagement perspective. And what I say to the say to the guys and girls now that work for me, if you're seeing too much of me, it's for one of two reasons. Either I'm worried about your performance or I've got or, or I've got over enthusiastic and I'm too close to the job. Mm. Your job is to find out what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So is if it, it's, is if it it's hard, my enthusiasm, though? tell me yeah. and I push back. Mm-hmm. If it's if it's if, I, if it's my concern with the individual's job to do the job, they should know. And we should be working closely together to resolve the situation. Listen, as a um self-confessed control freak. I, I find it hard to do that. I, we've got um, six of us working for us. We have some great trainers. Um, for people who listen to this, I've never been a dealer principal. I've only ever been a general sales manager. I employ people that have been dealer principals and successful people uh, in the business because because we have to. But I still find myself being a control freak. He's run the course like that. Oh, I would have done it this way. I did that yesterday with Andrew Clark. Sorry, Andrew. He knows more than me, Dale. But I'm still sitting there thinking, oh, is that right, Andrew? Can you do it this way? And of course, he was right. I was wrong. So my question is, as a control freak, is it difficult not to put your nose in where it's not needed? How do you back away? I think it's about realising what your job is and where you add value. Mm. And um, I think it's about understanding the impact that you have on somebody when you overmanage them. I want people that are confident, willing to take risks and um, willing to and, and to know that they're supported by me. So I think if you if you go to the process, the right process of recruiting somebody with all the skills to do the job, you should you should allow them to do it. So so let's open up the conversation. Um, you uh, introduced me to a great presentation about leadership, about mindset. Um, yeah. What is the job of a leader, a really great leader out there? What's their job? How do they become that great leader? Well, I think a leader's job is to answer the big question. And, and the big question is, where to from here and why you should follow me? I think that's the leader's job, is to answer the big question. So um, um, the first job is to establish where to from here, and then to create a compelling argument to get a team of good people to follow you on that journey. That's a leader's job. And I think as a leader, you need to remember that. And you need to be looking down on the business saying, who's on board, who's resting, and who's rowing in the opposite direction. So I think of the business as like a rowing boat mm-hmm. with a group of rowers. Some people are rowing with me. Some people are deciding whether to row or not. And others are rowing against me. And my job is to work out who's on board and who isn't. And to work it through. So, um, so, 
So I, I love the idea of this. Uh, this is a vision. This is where we're going. Okay. But then it's why you should follow me. That's a sales job, isn't it? Is leadership a sales job day in, day out? Yeah, I think it is. I think you need to sell the vision. So um, I have a document that always lives near me. It looks like this. It's got our vision on it. And I refer to that document consistently to align the employees with regards to what's important for us at the moment. Mm -hmm. And um, leadership is just about selling the same story. I was told that you have to set, tell somebody seven things before they hear it. Yeah. And um, and you've got to keep reminding people of what you want from them and what good looks like and keep people on track. So now back to the rowing boat, okay? Uh, you are the, the cox, for want of a better word. This is the vision. This is where we're going. You've got to row with me. You've got to work out who's rowing with you, who's sitting with a paddle in the water, and who's rowing against you. You must have in your life people rowing against you. People thinking, ah, oh, Dale's gone the wrong way. How do you deal with that individual? How do you stop that individual getting the rest of the boat to start rowing the other way? Yeah, I mean, I think if somebody's not rowing, there's either two, there's two reasons. It's either will or skill. They either don't want to or they haven't got the skills to. So, so my approach is to try and catch somebody doing the job well and reward them in the moment and say, hey, Simon, that was you at your best. That was brilliant. That's just what I'm looking for. I'm really pleased with you. Hey, everybody listen. Did you see that? Simon just did something good. Yeah. He followed the process, did a great result. And Simon is an exemplar of everything we want. What and, that and, does is reinforce, it reinforces the standard. And, and to pause you there, what Simon did well, not Simon's great, what he did was great. I think that's yes. an important distinction as well. So I'm critiquing the performance and not the performer. Yeah. Yeah. What that does, Simon, is give me permission to have a conversation with somebody when they don't deliver. Because I can say, Simon, I know you've got the skills. So I know it was Will. I know you couldn't be asked, Simon. And um, what stopped you from being asked today? What gives you the right to choose whether or not you're going to be you at your best? Because we need you at your best and you can do it. And um, yesterday you were an example of you at your best and today you just couldn't be asked. So um, why is it that you feel that, that that part of your job is non-negotiable? Yeah, yeah. I, I say that again for me. You love the perf the performer, but not the performance. Yeah, I think I think what you, what, what you do is you critique the performance, not the performance. It's not you, Sam. I know yeah. you're a good guy. I just don't yeah, like what love you it. did. Yeah, um, I, I love the singer, not the song. Was someone else told me once? Um, yeah. Is 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 a great phrase on that one as well. There. Okay. That just leaves me to say that all details of this episode and other episodes on the selling in the motor trade can be found on our website, simcotraining.co.uk. Go there to get a copy of our book, Words That Sell Cars. Go there to sign up to a free trial of our sales fitness online sales training program. Easiest way to get hold of me is Simon Bokert through LinkedIn. Thank you.